Um, so one definition, which I really wanted just to sort of clear up, um, as it's one of these terms that are often uh, thrown around is OPEX and CAPEX, and how do these relate uh, to the options for hosting uh, within your SaaS business model? So starting with the more traditional uh, CAPEX approach, uh, these are uh, you know, investments which are made by an organization where there's going to be a long term uh, benefit right into the future. So great examples of these with regards to a SaaS business is going to be the purchasing of things like servers, routers, etc. and all the other hardware that you need uh, to make sure you're able to do your on premise uh, data center and hosting, etc. The business will normally pay for all of this up front um, and there'll be an expectation that the kit will ha you know, have a very long uh, shelf life and will keep benefiting your business right into the future. CapEx projects, in my experience, aren't just difficult to get signed off because of the huge amount of funding required. Um, there's also a real need to make sure that you're correctly scoping what you're going to be purchasing. Um, and also you need to ensure that you've got the internal requirements to both deploy and maintain uh, the equipment. Um, the way this sort of uh, works within your financial statements is all the costs that are taken uh, from the capital expenditure are capitalised. And by capitalised, what we mean is take it up as a fixed asset, as you would with a, a vehicle or a laptop, etc. And these costs are then spread uh, through either depreciation or amortisation over a number of years and with a useful life. An interesting point is if you have an EBITDA metric, it does sit below that within your, within your PNL. OPEX, on the other hand, is where you tend to be charged monthly and it goes straight to the PNL. And by that, it goes straight into the costs. There's no spreading. And the reason for this is you know, you're charged almost as a pay as you go sort of model. And OPEX really does reflect uh, the ongoing costs uh, of the day-to-day you know, -day runnings of the operations. Um, and within this example, a subscription fee for cloud services is most definitely considered OPEX. Effectively, what's happened here is the cloud provider, uh, they've made the investment that you would have made into the infrastructure and investment up front, and therefore you only pay for the resources as you use them going forward. Interestingly, um, most of the drawbacks of the CapEx model um, are actually the strengths within the OPEX approach. Um, the approach with an OPEX is far more scalable, and it's going to be maintained by experts, far less risky, and the main benefit is you don't have huge uh, setup costs right up at the beginning. So now we've covered how hosting, OPEX and CapEx really affect the, you know, how you want to host um, your SaaS products um and you know, given the additional flexibility that you get with it i also just wanted to cover how your own software development uh, and your own internal costs can be affected by this opex and capex decision so pre sas world you know, many years ago now um software was going to be de developed over long time periods um, and these costs would then be released periodically the reason for this is businesses would be incurring huge amount of costs, being uh, developer costs, UX engineers, etc. All of whom will be working together to sort of build up to the next uh, iteration of the revenue you're wanting to release. Um, so therefore, by moving these costs up to the balance sheet and amortising them over um, a long time period, you're sort of spreading the cost as and when it matches the revenues that their work will be generating. In my own opinion, I think this is a very almost outdated view. Um, as these days, a SaaS environment is all about continuous improvement. Uh, the software itself is never, in a weird way, never actually going to be done. You're constantly going to be evolving it, improving it, and developing on it. Um, so, good examples of, you know, uh, of this is things like uh, new, new functionality being added, security patches, and these are, these can now be done on a monthly, weekly, and daily basis. Um, and even the concept of versions is becoming a bit of a, you know, a, a, an older idea. Within this example, within a SaaS environment, I think the, the, you have the option whether or not you want to capitalise your time. Um, so what sort of considerations would you want to put forward on this? First of all, your funders and owners, um, these you know, your people who are backing you in the business and people who have an interest in it, um, they will definitely have an opinion on whether or not you should be capitalising your development costs internally. 
time required um, by your engineers and developers who are working on the product is quite a huge undertaking detailing exactly what they're doing and what you can and cannot not capitalize whereas realistically you want them focusing on your product and developing it uh, to move forward um, profit and cash as soon as you start capitalizing items and moving it up to the balance sheet your profit no longer matches your cash flows you still have to pay these engineers the money will still come out of your um, uh, your bank account um, however you, you're almost hiding the cost and therefore there's a difference between your profit and your cash and the key thing is it's very easily adjusted back if a business is capitalizing a million pounds worth of you know, development costs into the balance sheet uh, an investor or a private equity firm or whoever want, is, wants to look at your financial statements can just add it straight back in and the final um, decisions are really based around local regulations and tax regulations um, and the key thing there is, is to go and get some professional advice on those because um, every business is unique so finally on the capex and opex um, point of view um, we also have how are you going to be emphasized to your customers um, just like yourselves your customers are going to have a, an opinion on opex and capex and favor two potential routes on how they consume and buy a product so uh, the initial example is uh, customer a uh, who is a usually going to be a small business most likely going to be a startup and they're going to have little cash they're not going to be able to source huge amounts of finance uh, to cover any large ups, upfront costs and they're going to want flexibility you know the business at the moment is working in one country they might be going um, to multiple geos and later later uh, iterations of the software etc it's also scalable you know, it might only be 10 employees 20 employees at the moment but it could be going up to you know, a larger organization in the future customer b almost the opposite you know, huge cash rich uh, business they know exactly what they want and they're large and established these guys are going to tend to know exactly what they want to get out of any uh, software products um, and you know, very much the opposite of customer array in this example both businesses are going to have budgets you know there is a financial control to help them plan for each entity and within the budget there will be decisions made on capex and opex decisions and, and funding required for both of these so customer a more than likely is always going to um, lean towards an opex solution um, the reason for this is that there are far less barriers for entry for them there's very little setup costs um, and allowing them to get that smaller solution that grows with them as the demand for the product increases their profits will be increasing etc so it's a really good journey for these guys to be on now you'd think with customer B being the absolute opposite of customer A, they would want the absolute opposite in, in favor of CapEx. However, recent years, larger entities really are moving forward towards OPEX and a key decision that you need to work with your, you know, with your clients on is how you deploy your products into, uh, you know, into them to be able to fit into both OPEX and CapEx um, purchasing requirements. So just because you are running a OPEX focused you know, approach to hosting and development doesn't mean that you aren't able to still sell to your customers and maximize your opportunities by selling both OPEX and CapEx. Okay, so moving on to sort of the second, third on SaaS metrics. Um, there's three main reasons why we would want to be using metrics uh, focused into SaaS um, and uh, all the information that these uh, provide. First one is driving performance. Obviously, being an accountant, you know, I tend to be towards financial performance. However, a lot of the metrics have, most definitely do have operational uh, slants in those as well, which is absolutely important. Second one is exit valuation. Um, by having SaaS metrics in, it really does define you as a SaaS business. It's strategic thinking, very forward looking, and it also shows that you're a, you know, a mature, well run business. Uh, and finally, is benchmarking. Benchmarking very often is, you know, people always pigeonhole it to be focused on just working with external um, competitors and your top two competitors. Where are they? Where are we at the moment? However, don't be afraid to take these benchmarks and compare against uh, other verticals within the SaaS market or even outside of SaaS as well, just to sort of see how other entities are performing against you and what you can learn from them. The other half of benchmarking is, of course, benchmarking against yourself and your uh, and your internal reporting uh, cycles. So a good example of this is, you know, where were you this time last year? What has improved? What hasn't improved? 
um, and then also compare you know, when you develop your annual planning and your budgets, etc. Put these metrics into there so you can see exactly where you are against your performance on a more metric base as opposed to pure financial uh, performance. So the four key metrics that I want to talk to you today on, uh, which are all focused into SaaS businesses and you know, how SaaS businesses work. Um, and the key things that these need to be used uh, collectively. So the first one is revenue. Uh, obviously it's the first line on your profit and loss. Uh, so very, very uh, key metric. Um, but the key thing is when you start moving to a you know, SaaS model, you may you have originally started out charging perpetual licenses up front or the very large capex uh, expenditure in front. Moving to a SaaS model, you're going to move to monthly billing and all of a sudden, quite literally, the number of days in each invoice and bill that you're raising to your customers needs to have the correct accounting uh, treatment on that. So if you invoice on the 15th, the second for the whole month, the second half of the invoice needs to be pushed forward into the second half. Admittedly, it does sort of back itself up and continue, but the number of discussions I've had with auditors on that is you know, quite frequent. So you've got to go and make sure you get it right from the outset. Second point is how you're going to categorize your revenue. There's so many different ways you can categorize it. Um, obviously, down to the product is obviously a key one, but then you know, are you going to be categorizing on the type of customer consuming it, the geography where they're consuming it, or the way that they're actually consuming it as well. The third point on the revenue recognition is it's fantastic. You know, you want them to split your revenue up, you know, doing it so accurately as well. Um, but have you got the systems and processes in place prior to getting this done? The worst place you want to be is you know, having a huge amount of sales coming through, but not being able to, to treat the revenue accordingly and get the right metrics out of it. And finally, as always, you've got to make sure it's compliant, so speak with your advisors and um, auditors just to make sure that your revenue recognition is on par. So once we've got the revenue recognised correctly in the accounts, we move towards a very key term within the SaaS market, which is monthly recurring revenue. So. The great thing about monthly recurring revenue is it keeps coming back. It's highly valued uh, as well uh, and it's predictable and stable. So where you are on one month, you expect it to be roughly where you are the next month with the incremental growth in sales. Key thing that you need to make sure that you do in your chart of accounts, your products, etc., is being able to split out your SaaS revenue from one time, per, yeah, from one time uh, revenue. So any sort of services that are being offered and that aren't baked into recurring revenue need to be clearly defined and separate it out for your own metrics. Once we have the recurring revenue sorted out, um, we then have our run rate annual recurring revenue. Possibly the simplest sum, you just take the monthly recurring revenue in times 12. Very good to do this, it shows the sort of scale that you're working on, um, and it is very forward looking to sort of show you know, within the date of your reporting cycle in the year, where are you and where we'd be expecting to be. You know, in, in the next year, so um, where you start, well, more importantly, where are you starting from? By doing this, you can then divide your total uh, annual recurring revenue by the number of customers that you have, and that gets us to an average revenue per customer. And you'll see how that comes into it later. And finally, the lovely revenue waterfall, a key part of any SaaS business's board pack, will be this. And effectively, what we do is we look at the previous month, and it could also be the previous year, and then work out what's new. And what's increased? So by that I mean net new business and new logo wins, and then what's increased? That could be more users, more data transfer, or however you're building that. And we'll talk about pricing in a second. You then have detractions of lost customers, and then uh, decreased consumption, so people potentially using your product less, etc. And that should add up hopefully to exactly where you are in the current month. And then you get a lovely waterfall chart like that, which shows instantly the movements in your uh, revenue. And it just shows, it allows you to demonstrate you, you have a full understanding of how your revenue has moved month by month. The second SaaS metric I want to talk to you about is the average cost of service. And this is working out how much it costs to maintain um, each customer uh, within your client base. Um, the cost that you actually included here will vary from business to business, and it's, it really is almost a cultural decision that you guys need to work out where specific costs sit. Account management is a good example. Is that an ongoing cost to the car to your customers, or do you see them as a, a sales function, etc.? The main thing that I would advise is just to make sure you're consistent with this metric. You know, don't dip costs in and out between different uh, sections. And the real thing here it also shows how your cost base is correlating with the increase in customers. 
if you were to double the number of you know, the amount of consumption um, the, the licenses etc would you need twice the level of support etc um, and also you know, if you would hope to start to see efficiencies with your know, economies of scale etc so with the average cost of sales bring that to ACS you would obviously expect to see your technical support in there account management again might sit in a different part for you um, but that's a decision you can make your hosting costs and the key thing is also understanding your hosting costs and knowing exactly what's going into what well, a good example is having test uh, development environments you don't want that coming into your cost of service and you need to have an understanding of that devops uh, how that works again you might want to put that into your development or keep it within your cost of service it's a decision to make and also if you have made the decision to um, amortize and you know, release the development of your products you've got to make sure that you build that cost in the software um, so the next one is customer retention um, so this is usually done within a you know, the first offer is a duration when you win a customer how many years are they going to be a, a loyal customer to you it's a difficult question to answer um, but there's two main ways you can do it is you have a look at your lost customer and see you know on average how long are lost customers with you if you have high churn it's quite a good way of doing it because you've got a large beta sample that you can go into and really see exactly how long customers are staying with you for otherwise you could with low churn you might be basing this on a, maybe even a couple of customers who have churn you can take the average customer base uh, for your current customers and work out you know, how long is the average customer being with us so you just got to make sure you find the calculation that suits you there another key customer retention is churn every SaaS business needs to have their iron churn I mean churn really shows you the expected loss um, within a given time period of um, the number of customers that you have it's always calculated on a percentage basis and um, with regards to calculation it's, it's effectively it's the number of lost divided by what you started with but the actual numbers you can put in there can vary so yes um so that is your chain calculation uh finally, uh finally we've got customer acquisition cost uh, and this really shows how much it costs um to onboard a new customer and also get them to sign up to your your, your product line etc so two key halves this is the cost to win uh, so this is the total cost of your sales team uh, or your sales commissions and marketing team etc and then you've also got the cost to actually onboard them so what you know, what costs are involved in getting contracts signed etc uh, any hosting setup costs and then do you offer any inclusive free training at the beginning or are there any is there any free initial uh, support etc so adding these two together gets us the total customer acquisition cost so I mentioned earlier that all of these metrics need to be used together and the key thing here is we get something to call the customer lifetime value so effectively what we're doing here is we're taking the average annual revenue per customer we're taking off that the average cost of the service so obviously the key thing here is the average cost and revenue to be over the same time period and then the uh, average customer duration i.e how long have you got them for so uh, it's margin effectively times by the number of years if you minus off of that the customer acquisition cost i.e how much it costs to win that customer and get that customer signed up and starting to consume the product you get to a very important number called your customer lifetime value um, of this it needs to be positive if you are spending too much on marketing etc um you therefore won't recoup the costs of the marketing effort and the sales effort uh, when the customer comes live uh, the other thing is it might be too expensive to maintain the customers so the key thing about this calculation is is every single decision that you've made within a SaaS business will affect one of these four components leading up to the customer lifetime value uh, a good ratio um, so you can also do it as a ratio of customer lifetime value as over customer acquisition cost which is effectively <coughs> Um, your, your return on your sales efforts a good uh, figure of about three or plus is, is industry standard uh, looking at hopefully about four or five times some additional performance metrics is your sales performance uh, versus your revenue um, key thing is in a SaaS business you have the you know this reoccurring revenue recurring revenue and billing if you were to miss your target for one month uh, and the sale doesn't happen that is actually going to keep hitting you on and on um, the SaaS business, uh, one of the SaaS businesses I used to work for, referred to it as the log pile, and effectively you've lost a whole row of your log pile that you're stacking on top of. 
forecasting a lot of businesses will either work in an MRR or an annual recurring revenue basis and what you want to do is make sure that all of your teams are focused on the same metrics uh, and also plan as such in your budget using the same uh, figures. Purchasing and planning, it's uh, accountants absolutely love working um, within a SaaS business because it's uh, predictable and you can use all of your churn matrix, uh, uh, metrics, etc. just to plan for so you know exactly where you're going to be. And also the ability, as I hinted to before, of using your customer lifetime value on a budgeting basis on your budget, but also on your actuals really shows where you're deviating from your plan. And the key one is cash flow and your cash relevant profit. Um, if you are doing your capitalizing and development costs, make sure that you keep that. Um, the, the, keep an eye on your cash as well as your profit because you don't want to be deceiving yourself. So some more general commercial uh, considerations is pricing. Uh, the first one is we have pricing strategy. So pricing strategy is the method that you will use to determine the price of your SaaS, uh, SaaS offering. Um, first one is competitor based pricing, where you just have a look at the market, see when enough is charging and place yourself slightly above it, slightly in the middle or slightly below, however you see your product fitting in. You then have cost plus pricing, difficult to do in SaaS, I would say, because what you're doing is, you know, what is the true cost of a continuously improving uh, piece of software? You then have value based. Um, this is where if you have a interesting product that say it's you know, 20p per transaction for a business, they'd be more than willing to pay 15p for that because the value they're deriving from it is, is a good return on their investment. And also penetration pricing, especially for you know startups or smaller businesses. If you want to make a name for yourself, you might go slightly lower than you want to be to build the momentum behind you. The other half to pricing is pricing models, and this is once you've worked out what you want your prices to be, this is how you present them to your customers. Um, so single rate. A lot of businesses love the simplicity of having a single rate for all different kinds of the product that you're offering. Tier pricing, you'll, you can have uh, bronze, silver and gold, uh, for example. User base, are you doing it per user or are you basing it on what those users are consuming? You then have add-ons and features, which also links to freemium. Uh, businesses do put out free pieces of software and expect you to upgrade with the add-on and features later. Some additional just general business performance thing is your time to revenue. Once you um, have sort of, you know, won the business and, you know, and signed the contracts, etc. How long has it taken to get that revenue recognised? What you don't want to happen is to have a, a slow onboarding team or a, you know, a delay in the sales team handing over the information that's required. Sales commissions is a, is a hot topic within SaaS businesses. Um, because of the nature of the work, you can sign you know, effectively a huge deal, but the first invoice that goes out the door is one twelfth of the annual contract value. So what you want to do is work out a very good commission scheme and how does that work? When does a account stop you know, requiring the work to renew? They effectively become a house account. You're going to need a scalable development team because you know, the, if there are waves uh, of development of your SaaS product, you need to be able to rein that back, but also invest quickly in that. And also, have you got the systems being the CRM, finance systems, etc., to help with your SaaS offering? And the key thing, which does link with your strategic partnerships, is you know who can you work with to really bring in all your systems together and make it a key part of your SaaS um, strategy. Finally, we've got some uh, tax and legal. There are Many tax credits, uh, R&D tax credits available from HMRC and there are other grants to support. Key thing is you might not be able to get both um, and or either one or the other, but uh, definitely uh, try and get some professional advice on those uh, from a professional who knows your individual circumstances. Make sure everything you do is contracted. Um, there's nothing worse than winning, you know, millions and millions of pounds worth of uh, revenue and finding that everyone can leave tomorrow and there's no value in it because of it. Um, and then obviously data protection security will be forming um, a session later today, uh, so I won't go into too much detail there. And then finally safeguarding IP, if you've invested all this money in developing your, your, your software, you want to make sure it's guarded uh, and protected accordingly.